Hi everyone, it's Jindy Burwell here. Um, while since I've recorded a message, so um, here we go. I'm the vicar, the priest in charge of the Anglican Church in Albany, North Shore of Auckland and over in Green Heights. Welcome, welcome to you who are here with Today we will hear a little about a lawyer who asks Jesus how to achieve eternal life, fullness of life. And upon being reminded of the need to love God and his neighbor, he pushes the question one step further, who then is my neighbor? And in response, Jesus tells a story that would have shocked his listeners then and should still shock us now. Jesus wants to challenge our ideas about who the good person is. But that's the third reading. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read the readings that are laid down for Sunday the 10th of July, 2022 and reflect really briefly upon the first two, and then a little more on the gospel reading. So firstly, the reading is from Amos, a Old Testament prophet. I'm gonna read a really small part of it, but I encouraged our worshiping community to read all of Amos this week. Um, these Old Testament prophets, they knew how to say some stuff to people who claim to follow um, God. So anyway, this little part from Amos 7, 7 to 17. The Lord showed me a vision of himself standing beside a wall and holding a string with a weight tied to the ebbit. The string and weight had been used to measure the straightness of the wall. And then he asked, Amos, what do you see? A measuring line, I answered. The Lord said, I'm using this measuring line to show that my people Israel don't measure up. And I won't forgive them anymore. Their sacred places will be destroyed and I will send war against the nation of King Jeroboam. Amazar, the priest at Bethel, sent this message to the king of Israel. Amos is plotting against you in the very heart of Israel. Our nation cannot put up with his message any longer. Here is what he is saying. Jeroboam will be put to death and the people will be taken to a foreign country. Then Amos told me, Amos, take your visions and get out. Go back to Judea and earn your living there as a prophet. Don't do any more preaching at Bethel. The king worships here at our national temple. But I answered, I'm not a prophet. And I wasn't trained to be a prophet. I'm a shepherd and I take care of fig trees. But the Lord told me to leave my herds and preach to the people of Israel. And here you are telling me not to preach. Now listen to what the Lord says about you. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city. Your sons and daughters will be killed in war and your land will be divided among others. You will die and the people of Israel will be dragged from their homeland. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church if the church will listen. I'm using this measuring line to show that my people Israel don't measure up. 
something, as I said at the beginning, something I really noticed about the prophets is they are preaching to God's people about how they need to return, to repent and turn back to God, to turn away from whatever idol or thing gotten into and come back to God. The key being they are preaching that message to people who are claiming to be in line with God or trying to follow God or being um, an Israelite. So there they are, you know, preaching this message to the people who, who are meant to be, you know, reading the Torah, following the Torah, doing, you know, those things. And they're not. I've got corrupted and they're doing other things now. And the prophets are getting them to come back. The prophets aren't cruising around moralizing to every Tom, Dick, and Harry. They're saying to the people who are claiming to be people of God, if you're claiming to be a person of God, well, God wants this, not that. So, you know, sort yourself out. Something really important to hear in their context then, but also today. To us. Um, we'll come back to it with the gospel, but I think let's not get so caught up in the I'm a good little Christian, look at me, I'm a Christian, I'm following God, and now I'm going to moralize to everyone else what they should be doing. Actually, we need to be constantly thinking, am I doing what I should be doing? Do I need to hear? the prophet's words and to repent and come back? Have I gone astray and need that measuring line to measure my life to see whether or not it's straight, you know, how it should be? And I think sometimes we can get a long way away from the message of God, our own lives, while running around moralizing about all sorts of other stuff. And we see it, you know, the Supreme Court in America, you know, all these Christians wringing their hands about things, but actually maybe they need to hear the prophets before they get off their high horse about everyone else. And if that is true there, it may be true here too. The prophets' hardest messages were to church people, were to the Jewish people, to the synagogue, to, you know, in our day, to us. I've encouraged my congregation, my community, to read all of Amos this week, and, and I raise that same invitation to you, because, oh, he says some stuff to the believers about our behavior. We'll leave that challenge with you. The epistle reading, I wasn't going to read um, in this forum, but I've changed my mind, and so I will. It is a small part of the letter to the Colossians, um, Paul's letter, the opening. So it's Colossians 1, Verses 1 to 14. From Paul, chosen by God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and from Timothy, who is also a follower. To God's people who live in Colossia and are faithful followers of Christ. I pray that God our Father will be kind to you and bless you with peace. Each time we pray for you, we thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have heard of your faith in Christ and of your love for all God's people, because of what you hope for is kept safe for you in heaven. You first heard about this hope when you believed the true message, which is the good news. The good news is spreading all over the world with great success 
it is spread in this same way among you since ever since the first day you learned the truth about God's wonderful kindness from our good friend Ephesus. <clears throat> He works together with us for Christ and is a faithful worker for you. He is also the one who told us about the love that God's Spirit has given you. We have not stopped praying for you since the first day we heard about you. In fact, we always pray that God will show you everything he wants you to do and that you may have all the wisdom and understanding his Spirit gives then you will live a life that honours the Lord, and you will always please him by doing good deeds. You will come to know God even better. His glorious power will make you patient and strong enough to endure anything, and you will be truly happy. I pray that you will be grateful to God for letting you have part in what he has promised his people in the kingdom of light. God rescued us from the dark power of Satan and brought us into the kingdom of his dear son, who forgives our sins and sets us free. To God's people who live in Colossia and are faithful followers of Christ. That's who Paul is writing to. To please note that Paul is writing to those people who claim to be following Christ, who claim to have found the space and now be walking in that way. And it's full of beautiful things like the good news is spreading, um, wonderful kindness, wisdom and understanding, and that you please God because you're doing good deeds. Paul is always praying that God will show up and be in your life and you will then live that out with love and grace and mercy and understanding and you will live a life that is wonderful and good. And sometimes Paul has, you know, some kind of strong words of correction. You know, that thing, maybe you could do better. But he is always writing to the people who claim to be a follower of Christ. Let's not be taking his words and slinging them around like arrows to other people. It's kind of meaningless to them. But it is a direction to us for how we shape our lives, what measuring stick we're using for our lives. Hey, I'm having to record this in two parts because of technical difficulties. So let's now hear the gospel reading, which is Luke 10 and it's verses 25 to 37. An expert in the law of Moses stood up and asked Jesus a question to see what he would say. Teacher, he asked, what must I do for eternal life? Jesus answered, what is written in the scriptures? How do you understand them? The man replied, the scriptures say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind. They also say, love your neighbours as much as you love yourself. Jesus said, you have given the right answer. If you do this, you will have eternal life. But the man wanted to show that he knew what he was talking about. So he asked Jesus, who are my neighbors? Jesus replied, as a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, robbers attacked him and grabbed everything he had. They beat him up and ran off, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. 
But when he saw the man, he walked by on the other side. Later, a temple helper came to the same place. But when he saw the man who had been beaten up, he also went by on the other side. A man from Samaria then came traveling along that road. When he saw the man, he felt sorry for him and went over to help him. He treated his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then when he put him on his donkey and took him to an inn, where he took care of him. The next morning he gave the innkeeper two silver coins and said, please take care of the man. If you spend more than this on him, I will pay you when I return. Then Jesus asked which one of these three people was a real neighbor to the man who was beaten up by robbers. The expert in the law of Moses answered, the one who showed mercy. Jesus said, go and do likewise. May we hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. That is to God. It's an interesting story. One, if you've been in and around church for a while, you might have heard a number of times. You might even find a way to easily dismiss what the first two people did. And I would suggest that that is not the case. So what do we have today? <clears throat> well, I read a really interesting article which I had to get a librarian to track down for me. It's in the Journal of Legal Medicine, and it was titled The Good Samaritan in Jewish Law. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. I'd like to read that. So it is an article about legal things and in medicine issues. Um, from a Jewish perspective, because I really wanted to sort of say this story is about Jewish people in Jewish times, and Jesus is telling a story. So, so what might the Jewish people that were hearing it already know and be aware of in their own um, world? Turns out there are laws and writings beyond the Bible that clearly make it known that it is expected of Jewish people to help out someone who is you know, in a bad way or needing help. Um, that came through the legal, um, the medicine legal article very clearly. Goes back to a comment earlier in the Hebrew Bible that says, you shall not stand on the blood of your neighbor. Um, and, and there's lots of writings that say it is the law and the absolute expectation that people would help people. If, it, if you incurred cost for doing so, the expectation is that the person would pay you back. So there is kind of no excuse to not have helped this person. I think it's interesting because no matter what the rules are, no matter what the law is, we will choose to ignore it if we so wish. The law doesn't make us be good people and do the right thing. The law might allow us ways to jump through hoops and maneuver things so that we can look like we're trying to do good things but not actually doing them. These stories about three people are normally three similar people. So stories like this would often have been told amongst Jewish um, Israelite people. It was the priest, it was the Levite, and then there was the general Israelite people. 
And those general Israelite people looked, they did the right thing. So this message, this parable, the story from Jesus is phenomenal because he's setting it up for what they're expecting and then clobbers them with the Samaritans then came and did the right thing. The absolute enemy to the people that are hearing the story, that person did the right thing. That person is not under the law to do so and yet did so. When I grew up outside of faith and not in, in this at all and I knew nothing of it, I still was aware of some people who went to church and claimed to be good people. We would often kind of joke or comment that, that someone else was actually a better Christian than the Christians were. We all knew people who were much, much better at doing the, the good work or the caring for others or they would give you the shirt off their back. And yet often the people who should have been that person, they stood around wringing their hands talking about the Bible or quoting scriptures or whatever, but not actually doing the stuff. They would sort of joke that they were so heavenly minded, they were no earthly good. And so then when I read these stories from Jesus and I go, oh my gosh, it was happening even then too. This Samaritan was better was a better Jew, if you like, than the Jews or the Israelites. He was better at the rules of caring for other people than the very people who had that as their law to do so, which I find very interesting. Sad, but very interesting. Uh, even Pope Francis says that um, just being a Christian and going to church does not make you automatically a good person. You may know the things, but are you doing them? The prophets, as we've already heard, were always calling people back to what they should be doing because they knew the stuff but just didn't do it always been happening and still happens unfortunately. There's also a common um, thing that's said often to try and justify why the first two people didn't do what they were supposed to do. Around all oh, but this person might have been dead and you weren't supposed to touch a dead body, you might become unclean if you you know got involved with that. And it's actually not the entire truth. Um, they were allowed to, to touch and do things. In fact, they were expected to, and if they did not, there's another Jewish writing that says, even a high priest may become unclean because of a neglected course. So not just unclean because you went over and touched the corpse and did a good thing. You might become unclean because of a neglected corpse anyway because you are meant to take care of people. And then the talk that, oh, but, you know, the priest is going up to Jerusalem and, and he couldn't be unclean or he wouldn't be able to do the worship stuff in the temple and that's really important. Actually, if you read the text, he is coming back from Jerusalem. He has been to Jerusalem, done his temple religious stuff, and he is now on his way back. So again, he could have and should have. I think it's really interesting to look at the readings we have today. 
and see what they have in common. Amos, the Old Testament prophet, calling people back to justice, always calling people back to what God requires, which is not just hand-wringing and moralizing for other people, but to actually live the way God wants you to. Particularly if you are a person who has chosen to live that way, to believe that, to follow in the way of Christ, then, then these are messages for you, not for everyone else. And then the Good Shepherd, or the Good Samaritan, who is our neighbour? Well, our neighbour is not just, oh, look at that hurt person, let's go and help that hurt person. Our neighbour is the person who is doing the helping. And let's be honest, there are a lot of amazing people doing amazing work and helping and healing and working with people. Be more than we are. You know, you see all these secular organizations doing environmental work, doing healing work, doing good, good work, sharing what they have so that someone else can have too. And we should be getting in beside them and along with them and treating them as our neighbor, loving them as our neighbor, and going and doing likewise. I don't think it is enough for Christian people here in New Zealand or overseas to get all caught up in, in changing the law back so that we can carry our guns or oh my gosh people absolutely should not have abortions no matter what and, and doing the most bizarre moralizing about stuff while other people are getting on with just caring for people and so that is our challenge and what will we choose to do with that